The idea came from producer Mark Minton, who'd been friends with the Sung family for 10 years. Uh, and he was talking to them about this trial that was imminent. And he called me up one day and he just said, there's this amazingly crazy thing going on in New York with this family-owned bank, a Chinese family-owned bank. They're the only bank to be criminally indicted in the wake of the 2008 crisis. And I was like, what? So that's how it started. And then we eventually went to New York to film with the Sungs and as the trial was beginning, and that kind of hooked me. We followed them for the duration of the trial, which was about four or five months. Um, I didn't find out about the story until the trial was itself imminent. The, the, they had been through this ordeal, but in telling the story, we felt like it was really important that you get the sense of just what a long ordeal this was for the family, that it started back in, really in 2009, and carried through until 2015. It's got such a great title. Where, where did that come <laughs> from? Was it Matt Taibbi? It was Matt Taibbi, you know. I mean, we came up with Abacus for the first part of the title. We'll take some credit. <laughs> but, but when he, in the interview we did with him, which was one of the very first interviews we did, when he said small enough to jail, we thought, oh, well, we couldn't resist it. Mm -hmm. Many of the charges that they brought against the bank had as much to do with a kind of cultural insensitivity to the realities of lending in, the, in an immigrant and an immigrant Chinese American community as much as it had to do with any questions about whether fraud was committed. In the Sungs and a number of people feel like there was, there was a kind of profound insensitivity. The community felt under attack um, as a result of this. What we didn't do was grandstand on the race questions. And it's, I think that's a function of the kind of filmmaker I am. I, I feel like I want you as a viewer to have some ability to look at what's put before you and make some decisions for yourself about whether how racist it was, whether it was intentional or not. And so that's what we did. But a lot of people have come away from this film feeling very strongly that race was absolutely at the heart of it. And you know, I think it's because of what's in the film. So Cyrus Vance Jr., Cyrus Vance Jr., the D of New York, is in the film, but he did not agree to be um, interviewed or followed in any way during the trial. It wasn't, it was only after the trial that we were able to get Cyrus Vance Jr., as well as Polly Greenberg, who was the head of economic crimes that oversaw the case. And, uh, you know, it was great to have their voices in the film because even though this is a film that is sort of squarely behind <clears throat> the Sung family as they go through this. It was also important to lay out the case against them, and that's what that's what they did. And they never wavered in their position that you know it was a right thing to go after. No, I think part of what motivated them to talk to us was is that they felt so strongly that they were right about this. Uh, you know, I, and I believe that that conviction on their part was sincere. I think what they blinded themselves to was the fact that, that what they were charging this bank with was so petty and questionable that they never actually seemed to question their own motives, motives like wanting to plant a flag and say, we convicted a bank. They never seemed to question any of that about their case. They just plunged into it and believed that they were going to uh, bring this bank down. And I think they actually probably believed that the bank would roll over before the trial and plead guilty because no one wants to go to that great of expense uh, in a case like this. But in that respect, they were wrong because the Sungs were willing to fight this to the finish. And they had the means to do it. Even though they're a small bank, they had the means to mount their defense and fight this, and that's exactly what they did. Uh, we found out fairly early on that we weren't going to allow, be allowed to be in the courtroom. So we had to decide, okay, A, do you make the film even though you're not going to be in the courtroom? Well, we decided to do that. Then B, okay, well, how are we going to tell that part of the story? So that's where we came up with this idea of hiring a courtroom artist to go in and do sketches that we then expanded on uh, when we were editing the film. And we did uh, reenactments, um, mostly with actors of the, of the, um, the trial, you know, and, and the uh, testimony. But, but we were able to get the defense lawyers for the songs to do their part. So 
we tried to bring it to life as best we could in a dramatic way, and then the film goes back and forth between what's going on in the trial and what we were able to film in depth, which was how the Sung family was coping with it. There's a reporter that appears in the film, a television reporter, um, who says you have to understand that Thomas Sung is like George Bailey in Chinatown. And he wasn't the only one that made that reference. And I think a lot of it goes back to the 2003 crisis that befell the bank, where there was a run on the bank because of an employee who had absconded with some money, and suddenly there was a panic. And Mr. Sung had to, in the classic George Bailey fashion, he had to go and calm everybody down and say, look, I'm here. You have nothing to worry about you know, I will, you will be fine. And so I think it probably started there. And so I wish I could take credit for, for that idea, but really it was an idea that came to us from the community and then we just put it in the film. It was not easy to get jurors in the film. Uh, we had a, ter a terrific uh, co-producer named Nick Verbitsky who really made that pursuit. And he talked to every juror. I mean, he chased one juror into a bar, uh, you know. Um, but we were bound and determined to get at least two jurors, one who was on the side of wanting to find the Sungs uh, and the bank innocent, and one that was one of the jurors who believed in guilt. And we felt like it was really important to try to get both those voices in, and fortunately we were able to do that. Yeah, Hoop Dreams was yeah, my first real film, and, um, and I have continued over the years to make films that, that at times look like Hoop Dreams in, in terms of their, their kind of gritty, um, you know, cinema verite approaches, observational cinema approaches to people's lives, often in difficult neighborhoods and situations. So I've, I've done some of those films over the years, but I've also done different kinds of films. Um, and I think Hoop Dreams opened up a door uh, for me uh, to have a career in, as a documentary filmmaker that I might not have had otherwise. And so I've been lucky to be able to do all kinds of different films. This film is very different because it's a, it's in some ways it's a courtroom drama. Um, I did a film a few years ago called Life Itself about the critic Roger Ebert. Uh, that was a great opportunity for me to do a biography, which I had not done before. So, you know, Hoop Dreams really kind of made it all possible, but, you know, if I didn't continue to make work that people want to see, I don't know how long I would have lasted. <laughs> I know it resonates with, uh, with people outside because this film has been on the festival circuit. It was on the festival circuit for many months before the theatrical release. And we saw how it played with audiences. And yes, there were, uh, wonderfully, there were a number of Asians in the audience, more so than any of the films I've done before for obvious reasons, and that was great. But there were a lot of you know, uh, people who were not, people, white people, black people, you know, people of different ethnic ethnicities who came out to see the film and were moved by it, were angered at what happened to the bank. Uh, you know, so I know it's a film that relates beyond just that community. Hoop Dreams is arguably the first film originated on video to be theatrically released. I think that's could very well be true. Oh, I, I'm a big believer that it's not about the medium and it's not about even actually the quality as much as it is about what are you filming and do you have a story and do you have really compelling and interesting subjects that you're following. I think that far and away outweighs the, the tech. You know, when we shot Hoop Dreams, we shot it on <clears throat> Betacam and Betacam SP, I mean, those are technologies long gone, and the quality of that couldn't compare to film at that time. But it didn't seem to matter for audiences, right? I mean, people gravitated to the story and were compelled by the lives of, of the people we followed, and they, they kind of forgot about the fact that it wasn't as pretty as film, and I think that still holds true today. Well, I think people take away a number of things from this film. One is they, they take away that the, the story of the case itself and, and, and the way in which the film raises questions about the application of justice in this country. You know, and I think it's also a film about race and, 
and the unequal application of justice for people who are not white, right? Uh, I think it's also a film about um, family. And I feel like the portrait of them as a family is one of the lasting values of watching this film. And I've had a number of, of um, Asian viewers come up to me at film festivals and say, and I think in particularly Chinese <clears throat> or Chinese American um, festival goers and say, thank you so much for showing a portrait of our family life that's not a kind of stereotype of what our families are that, that many in America have. And that's really heartening to hear. I, I think originally Mrs. Sung, it wasn't that she didn't think the film should be made, but she didn't particularly want to be in it. And um, at the time I hadn't met her, so I didn't know what a loss that would have been. Um, but once I met her and we did an initial interview with her, then we were able to convince her to be more part of the film. I think with the other family members, there was this feeling that whatever their discomfort personally about being in this film, that what was at stake here was really uh, important and not just important to them and their bank, but to their community and what it had to say about their community and, and about the justice system. And so there was a sense that we're doing something here that goes beyond us and, and that we should be a part of it. And I have found over the years you know, I've been lucky to get people to cooperate and be in films of mine over in difficult circumstances. And generally, it's always because on some level they recognize that the story that we're trying to tell has larger implications than just for them. And they want and they feel a duty to some degree to, to be a part of it.